The Baseball by the Yard podcast, episode number five, tryout tips for coaches and players. Hey folks, listen up. Baseball has a problem. On the positive side, new technology allows players and coaches to see, measure, and collect data on just about anything we want. But ask anybody who has been around the game for a while, and they will tell you that something is missing. What I think is missing are the finer points of the game, field awareness, the mental side, the approach, the ability to know when and how to make adjustments, baseball IQ, and the ability to think for yourself on the baseball field. Those things you can't measure, but if players don't have those skills, their days in the game of baseball are numbered. Do you agree? If so, then you've come to the right place. Welcome to the Baseball by the Yard podcast, the podcast dedicated to teaching all those finer points of the game to players and coaches. I'm Coach Bob McCreary, former professional player and coach. Let's start the show, and let's start changing how we teach the game. All right, welcome back, everybody. I am Coach McCreary. Thanks so much for stopping by. Uh, This is the fifth episode of the Baseball by the Yard podcast, and I'm still... Uh, learning quite a bit. Uh, this I'm new to the podcast world. I've been doing my website for over 10 years now, so I can do that sort of with my eyes closed with blog posts and videos and things like that. But I'm still learning this whole podcast thing, so bear with me. hope you were enjoying the content up until now, and if you're new to the podcast, thanks so much. Uh, thanks very much for stopping by. All right, uh, today's podcast topic is about tryouts. Okay, so I'm going to give some tips here for coaches as well as players. Now, uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about me and my background, if you were to go to baseballbytheyard.com, and up top you could click on the uh, Coach's Bio tab, and you can see that I've had a pretty extensive career when it comes to being a player as well as a coach. So I've had tryouts um, at pretty much every level, um, from my son's eight-year-old travel team uh, all the way up to the professional level. Uh, I spent a lot of years coaching high school, even college and pro ball, middle school. So I've been at kind of every level. And uh, at every level, you have some sort of player evaluation or official tryout. So over the years, I've been able to pick up a couple uh, kind of patterns and tips. And so that's what today's podcast is for. So if you haven't been to the site, baseballbytheyard.com, I've been adding a lot of content recently. Uh, So go check that out. Look at those written posts in a variety of areas. Uh, But today we're going to focus specifically on tryouts. So when I come back, I'm going to start off with some tips for coaches. And then the second part of the podcast will deal specifically with tips for players who are about to get into tryout season in baseball. All right. So when I come back, we'll lead it off with coaches. Okay, here we go, folks. So let's lead off and talk about uh, some tips for coaches. Uh, Right now, as I am recording this, it is about the second week in February. So in just maybe three weeks or so, uh, the local high school teams here in Pennsylvania will be starting their trial process. They usually start the first Monday or something like that in March, if my memory is correct. And uh, a lot of the younger organizations, travel teams uh, that do their indoor workouts over the winter time, they start to have tryouts as well. So very often uh, I'll get some phone calls from uh, people that I know who might ask me to come stop by and help out with some tryouts uh, because I do have a pretty good experience with doing tryouts at a variety of different levels. And so we're going to lead off here and give some of the tips, some of the things that I've learned over the years when it comes to tryouts. And um I'm not going to touch on everything, uh, but I do have five five categories for coaches that I think would be important to know, especially if you're a, a beginning coach and just looking to have tryouts and be efficient and handle them in a proper way. Because a lot of things can go wrong with tryouts if you don't take care of some of these little things. Okay, so no particular order, but the first one I'll talk about is what I call uh, who are the eights. Okay, so normally when you have tryouts, every coach is going to have kind of a rating system or a ranking system. And a lot of people will use numbers. They may rank their players in various categories of the game from 1 to 5, 1 to 8, 1 to 10. Uh, In the major leagues, they used to do it um, up to, I think it was 80. So they would go like 10, 20, 30, 40, and so forth, up to 80. Now, when I did tryouts, I typically like to do 1 through 8. 
Okay, so one recommendation that I would use is always use even numbers. So if you were going to numerically rank a player who is, say, a pitcher or a hitter or a base runner, whatever you are uh, judging them on, I would recommend that you use even numbers. Uh, so 4, 6, 8, 10. The reason why is when you have those numbers spread out in front of you, normally on a, a chart of some sort that the coaches that are there to evaluate have in front of them, uh, if you have the numbers 1 through 8 listed across the page, half of those numbers are going to be to the left, and half of those numbers are going to be to the right. So there is no number that falls right in the middle there. Now, here's what I found, and a lot of people who do surveys take this into consideration as well. So let's say you're giving someone a survey, and they have to rank something on a scale from 1 to 5. A lot of people will take the easy way out and not commit one way or the other, and or they don't want to commit. And so the easiest thing for them to do is just to put a three uh, because they don't really want to put much thought into it. Maybe they really don't want to take the survey. And so they'll just give a lot of threes okay, as an easy way out. So if I'm coaching and I want kids to accurately evaluate players, I'm going to get, that, I'm going to get rid of that option. So I'm not going to use an, an odd number because I'm always going to have a number that is smack dab right in the middle. And I don't want any coaches who are helping me to resort to that. So if I have a scale from 1 to 8 and a player looks like he would be in the middle, the evaluator has to make a decision. Uh, am, I go, am I going to go with a 4, which is to the left of the half of those numbers, or do I have to bump up to a 5? So I'm forcing the evaluator to commit to one side or the other. Is the player below average or is he above average in this category? And I find that that's easier to use. And whether you go one through four, one to six, one to eight, one to 10, doesn't matter. But I would just recommend using uh, even numbers. And again, it, it forces your evaluators to make a decision and commit one way uh, or the other. Now, also with this category is oftentimes, especially at the younger levels, you may have uh, dads, moms, uh, coaches who are just there to help out with your evaluations, who uh, who may not all may not be all that knowledgeable when it comes to well, well, what is an eight, so to speak. So if I'm ranking people from one to eight, I want to make sure I have a little conversation with all the coaches beforehand and make sure everybody knows like what an eight would look like, what a six would look like, and so forth. So the easiest way to do this is typically there is one kid at a tryout that kind of everybody knows. This kid's the stud, whether it's a pitcher, hitter, or whatever. And so very often I'll tell the coaches, okay, in the area of pitching, this kid over here, that kid's an eight. And so we're going to judge all the kids off that kid. Uh, if you have a, a phenomenal hitter, then just tell the coaches, okay, this kid is the eight. And so we're going to judge everybody uh, off that one. So when major league scouts go around and they, they, they rank players on that scale, they used to do it up to 80. Uh, typically they would have a player in their head that matches that each number, uh, in that ranking. And then every time they go out and see a new player, they kind of compare, uh, to various players that they know that have particular numeric rankings and it makes it easier to do that. But a lot of your coaches aren't going to have that experience. And so, it's not a bad idea to have a conversation early on and just tell the coaches, okay, what, who here would be an eight? Who here would be a four? That kind of thing. Just so the coaches have a, a, a way to compare and make, make it a little more easy for them. All right, so that's the first tip. Just know who the eights are. Use even numbers and uh, make sure everybody knows kind of where people fall so they can make it easier on their evaluations. Now, the second tip I would give for coaches is decide what your priorities are as to what you're going to be looking for in a player. Obviously, there are a variety of things that you can look for, throwing ability, hitting, fielding, base running, those types of things. And so you want to try to come up with some sort of order and prioritize what it is that you want to evaluate. Now, for me, at every level, pretty much, I am looking for the ability to throw a baseball. So I coached at the high school level for 13 years here in Pennsylvania, and that is the number one thing I look for. The reason why is because if a player, I felt, if a player has a good smooth arm and a strong arm and fairly accurate, I can put that kid anywhere on the field. I can teach the kid to play first base, outfield, shortstop, uh, even catcher, third base, whatever. But you can't teach a kid to have a good arm. And so that's the first thing I'm going to look for. The kid doesn't have to have a, a cannon, 
but he should have a pretty nice delivery. Ball comes out of his hand pretty well. And so I definitely am going to give an advantage to a kid who shows that they can throw the baseball because that kid has a lot of value. I can put him anywhere on the field. Now, I know a lot of teams will look for, say, hitting. And, of course, I like hitting. That's actually second on my list. But I tell the kids there's only one DH on a team. So if all you can do is hit, there's really only one place I can put you, okay, in, in the lineup, and that is DH. But if a, if a player can throw, then I have nine different places on the defensive side of the baseball that I can play that kid. So I place a lot of importance on throwing. It is the one thing that I think is the hardest to teach kids how to do. It's either you can or you can't. And I've done a tremendous amount of uh, private lessons in my day. And, and like I said, that's probably one of the most uh, difficult things to reteach a kid how to do is throw a baseball if he doesn't do it well. And so that's the number one thing I look for. Now, as I said, the second thing I'm going to look for is hitting. And, of course, depending on the level that you're in, you know, if I'm in the upper levels, then kids have to be legit. Uh, because they're just not going to be able to handle the pitching at the high school, college, or pro level. Um, so you can use your discretion as to what specifically you're looking for in each category. But obviously the ability to hit is, says a lot. Uh, their eye-hand coordination, their power. You can also see pretty clearly what kids have already had instruction. Uh, you can see that pretty easily with the way they approach their swings and so forth. So you can see a lot. Um, it doesn't mean that the kid has to be hitting line shots everywhere, but I just want to be able to see good hands, good eye coordination, squaring the ball up on the barrel. Um, a lot of kids can be taught to swing, but that natural eye-hand coordination is something that I'm uh, definitely going to be looking for uh, early on. After that, I'm probably going to do a lot of defensive drills. Uh, defense is not just catching and throwing. You can learn a lot about a player's baseball IQ by looking at him on the defensive side of the ball. Especially if you put him on a field in situations and start hitting the ball around with fungos, putting base runners there. Um, some players just have a knack as knowing where to be and kind of they have a good idea about how the game is played and the general awareness of what's going on around them. And you don't often see that in the batting cage, but you're definitely going to see that on the defensive side of the ball. Now, next up, if I'm evaluating players, I'm probably going to look at just general uh, athleticism. It's another another part of uh, a player that you generally are not going to be able to teach. Now, when it comes to athleticism, uh, what more importantly for me is what I call usable athleticism. So, for example, I may time players in a, say, a 60-yard dash. But one thing I have to understand as a coach is there's there's not any time in baseball where you're going to have a player run in a straight line for 60 yards. Okay, So if I do have players run a 60-yard time, I'm just getting a general idea of their athleticism. Part of that is running speed. But I'm not just going to stop right there because I've, I've certainly played with and seen a lot of guys who can fly but cannot run the bases at all. Uh, you, you force them to make turns and rounding bases and hitting the inside corner, and they're falling all over the, pla all, all over the place. So uh, running speed is one thing. It is a good indicator of overall athleticism, but uh, it is not the end-all, be-all. Uh, now, another example of this is if you were to watch, go to YouTube and look for some of the first pitch ceremonies and look at NBA players. If a major league team brings out an NBA player and has that player throw out the first pitch, it is brutal the way they throw a baseball. It is amazing. And you could argue that NBA players uh, could be considered the top athletes in the world. And yet put a baseball in their hand, and it is brutal. It is painful to watch some of them throw a baseball. So the point of me saying that is athleticism doesn't always translate well to baseball. So I'm going to look for a variety of athleticism because, again, it's not something you could teach. But I also want usable athleticism for the game of baseball. I think that's more important. And then lastly, what I'm going to rank uh, when I'm looking at players is their makeup. Okay, I want to know how they handle themselves, particularly when things don't go well. If they don't have a good round in the batting cage, how do they react to that? If they make a mistake on a ground ball or if they're in a bullpen and not, things aren't going well, how are they reacting? Uh, there's a lot of things that can go into makeup, but that is something that I'm going to pay close attention to. And I'll talk more about that when I give some tips to the play, uh, players uh, later on in the podcast. All right, so the first tip was 
uh, deciding how you're going to rank them in terms of the numbers. Second one was a priority and uh, creating a priority of what you're going to be looking at when you are ranking them. And the third one here is use stations. Now, a couple of years ago, I happened to be in the area where there were some tryouts occurring. I think my daughter was having a soccer practice or something. And so there's a baseball field nearby, and there just happened to be some tryouts going on. And so I'm watching uh, them conduct the tryouts, and I counted. Uh, there were, I believe, 35 kids on the field, and one of the players was batting, and literally the other 35, 34 players were out on the field standing there doing nothing, watching the guy hit the bat or hit the ball and just waiting their turn. And that's all they did the entire tryouts. Now, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus because I wasn't there. I'm not the coaches. I don't know what's going on there. But um, I would say if you're a coach and that's your strategy for tryouts, you're really opening yourself up to a lot of criticism. So using stations uh, is clearly to your advantage. Now, let's say I have four coaches, uh, including me. Well, then I would divide the kids up and use four stations. Um, and basically each station during tryouts would be a different uh, component of the game. Maybe one station is the base running station, next one is fielding, next one's throwing, next one's hitting, and just moving the kids around. Uh, not only is that going to help you keep the kids moving, but in the end of tryouts, kids can look back and say, all right, well, at least I had a chance to show the coaches what I can do in every facet of the game. So the more people you can get moving around certainly is going to be uh, the, the, the best way to handle that. So especially over the course of several days, if you have uh, stations run every single day and you just take different areas of the game and make it a station, uh, you certainly can see a lot in a short period of time. It also keeps the pace up and keeps the kids moving and keeps them more active uh, as well. Okay, so the fourth tip here is if you can, have more than one cut. Okay, so what I would try to do at the high school level is ideally we'd like to have a week worth of tryouts. So say Monday through Friday, uh, weather permitting. And at, at my high school, we had a pretty big high school in terms of enrollment. So uh, for two teams, JV and varsity, I would usually keep in the area of, say, 30 to 34 players, depending on the year and what our needs were. And we may have 50, 60 some kids try out. For both of those teams. So that's a lot of people on a baseball field to handle tryouts. So it's to your advantage as a coach. If you have those large of numbers, it's to your advantage to have two sets of cuts. The first cuts I would do after maybe two or three days. And really those are an attempt to remove the kids that clearly just are not going to be able to play at this level. It gets them off the field so that the coaches can now focus on the remaining kids where we need all eyes on them. Now, you're also, it may seem cruel to get rid of kids after the first couple of days, but in many ways, especially at the high school level and middle school level, very often those kids will immediately move over and start playing another sport. Um, but if you keep them the entire week when all the teams are generally doing tryouts, uh, and they do not make the team, sometimes it can be tougher for them to just transition into another sport in the spring season. So you may think it's uh, kind of harsh to cut kids after uh, two or three practices, but often it, it, it can actually help them and help them move on a little bit faster. And it helps you because you're uh, decreasing the number of kids on the field. It's safer. And again, you can put more eyes on the kids who are kind of more on the bubble and give them a fair shot uh, as well. Now, the last tip that I have for coaches is to fill in the gaps. Now, this is this is one of the tougher parts about tryouts, and tryouts were a, kind of a, a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, everybody's happy to have tryouts because you're back on the field, it's baseball season again, and and everybody's putting on the glove and running around, and it's, it's, it's a great time of year. But it's also, for me, it was also the worst time of the year because I have to tell a lot of kids that they're not going to be able to play, uh, regardless of what age group they're in. That's that's not fun. I never considered that uh, a good time to be doing that. Now, I said that the concept for this particular tip is called fill in the gaps. So what parents, particularly if they have not been around sports, what, what parents will often do if they don't know kind of how you ran tryouts and what you were looking for, 
and their child does not make the team, very often they will fill in the gaps with whatever they think is going on. And typically that's not to your advantage. Um, they'll make accusations about you playing politics and you playing favoritism and so forth. So what I try to do, especially at the high school level, is prior to tryouts even starting, I would have the normal registration meeting at school and let kids know, hey, here's how we're going to be running tryouts and so forth and get their names and all that. But I would also send them home with a letter to their parents. And I will try to find a copy of this letter and put it in the show notes here. So if you go to baseballbytheyard.com and you go to the podcast section of the page and you go to this particular podcast, I typically keep show notes where uh, if there's any links or anything I talk about in the podcast, I usually put them there. So I will try to find a copy of this letter for you guys. And what I what I do is I, I outline to parents in this letter exactly what it is that I'm looking for. Okay, so earlier in this explanation, I talked about the things that I look for. And pretty much that whole explanation is going to be in that letter. I tell them how we conduct tryouts, what it is that we look for, how we rate players, and so forth. So what I'm trying to do is to try to fill in as many gaps as possible for parents so that if their son does not make the team, it becomes harder for them to fill in the gaps because I've already filled in the gaps and explained to them exactly how I'm doing tryouts. Now, that being said, you're always going to have people who will agree with that letter and be totally on board with it. But when it's their child that doesn't make the team, then they start making stuff up. But at least you have a lot of ammunition. Now, if you're in school, uh, I would highly recommend that you give that letter not only to the players, but I would give a copy to the athletic director. I would give a copy to the principal, might even pass it around to some upper administration like uh, assistant superintendent, superintendent, because what ultimately will happen eventually if you coach long enough, particularly in schools, is people will bypass you and go directly to the principal, to the superintendent to complain about you and how you run tryouts and so forth. And so it becomes important to fill in the gaps in their minds as well. And I know this helped me when I was a coach at the school level, because I know there were parents that did go directly to the principal to complain about how I ran tryouts and so forth. And if the principal already had that letter in their hands prior to those phone calls occurring, very often uh, it gets stopped right there because the principal will say, well, I have this letter in front of me. I know your player got this. And so it's all explained right there. And so that really shoots down a lot of the complaints that you may get. So try to think ahead. Uh, I found that to be very helpful to send that letter home so I can fill in as many gaps as possible so people don't fill those gaps with nonsense. And again, giving that to as many people as possible, you'll get some advocates on your side who will defend you um, if they have that letter in their hands uh, as well. Okay, so the five tips here. Know who the eights are, basically and know your ranking system and make sure everybody's on board with know, knowing how to rank them. Use even numbers as possible. So the second one was create a priority list of what it is you want your coaches to focus on. For me, it was throwing, but you can do whatever you need to there. Use stations as much as possible. Um, try to have multiple cuts if you can. And then really work to try to fill in as many gaps as you can in the minds of players, parents, and administrators as well. Okay, so that's going to do it for coaches. Uh, when I come back, we'll do the same thing and talk about what players need to know about trials. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some things for you players out there. So if you're a player and you're watching this, obviously this time of year is a little nerve-wracking, especially if you have uh, not been at this level before. So if this is your first year in high school, then you're probably going to be a little nervous. So let me give you guys some tips as well. Now, now for the coaches aspect of this, I gave kind of five categories of tips. But for players, I'm just going to give two general categories and then uh, some other things to keep in mind as well. So first off, for players, you, you really cannot get past being physically prepared. Okay, and I understand guys play different sports and so forth, but the last thing you want to do is show up to a tryout and not be physically prepared. So do the best you can 
to throw, uh, get your body in shape and so forth. Now, you heard me say earlier that I place a lot of emphasis on throwing strength and your arm strength. So I think that's key. So if you were one of my players trying out, I would strongly recommend that you do uh, a lot of throwing prior to tryouts. If you are going to wait until tryouts to pick up a glove and a baseball and a bat, then chances are these days you're going to be at a pretty significant disadvantage. Now, as a coach, I fully understand that there may be some kids who play multiple sports, and that's tremendous. I always recommend kids play other sports. But One of the things I am going to look at is a player's ability to do a lot of things with their arms and so forth and throwing and hitting. So obviously, the better prepared you can be, uh, obviously, that's only going to hurt you. All right. So be prepared physically, work out, run, do some conditioning, especially if you're not playing other sports. If you're going to throw long toss, I would highly recommend getting your arm in baseball shape, not just long tossing, but Consider what positions you're going to play and what types of throws you're going to have to make. Um, If you're a middle infielder, for example, you're going to be throwing at all different arm angles. And so you want to make sure your arm is prepared for that prior to tryout. So don't just go out and throw right over the top and long toss. Uh, That's great, but also mix in some more position-based throws uh, as well. Now, the next tip I have for players is to look like a ball player. Okay, coaches do pay attention to this. It's not the end all be all because obviously you may have some social economic things where you have some kids trying out that may not be able to afford uh, top equipment and so forth. And I I don't really care about that. That's fine. Um, But there is something to be said about carrying yourself like a baseball player. And that's not just how you look in terms of the clothes and uniform and things you wear. A lot of it is confidence, okay? You move like a baseball player. So we talked about athleticism. And so trying to move like an athlete is all about how to look like a baseball player. Also, make sure it's appropriate for the weather. I can't tell you how many times uh, given doing tryouts in Pennsylvania in March where you know, the wind chill is in the 40s and so forth, and I'll have some players come out with short sleeve sur- uh, shirts on. There's been a number of times where I've told the kid, listen, you can't be here. You can't be outside with no sleeves on, and it's 40-some degrees. You're going to have to go inside and find a hoodie to find something. Uh, so be prepared, okay? That, the, that attention to detail is going to make you more look like a ball player. Okay, that you're ready to play regardless of what the conditions are. Whether you are asked to try out indoors or outdoors, you are prepared. And that goes a long way into looking and acting like a ball player. Now, one of the other tips in this category of being prepared is do some intel work. Now, I said before, prior to me doing tryouts, I would always have a meeting with the players and kind of go over what exactly we're going to be doing during tryouts to give them a chance to prepare, to get outside, to hit, the throw, and so forth the best they can so they're not walking into tryouts without knowing anything as to how we're going to do things. But if the coach doesn't provide that information for you, then there's a number of things you can do. First off, if you, if you know any players that have been through these trials before with this coach, certainly ask around. You know, The more information you know as to what you're going to have to do during the tryout phase, the better off you're going to be. Uh, human beings don't typically like surprises. We, we like to know what we're about to walk into. It makes it much less stressful and anxious. So the more you can find out, uh, the better. And uh, I would strongly recommend that if you had a question, reach out to the coach. I know if I received an email from a player who wanted to try out and said, hey, coach, I'm my name is such and such. I'm trying out. I just wanted to get an idea of some of the things that I'm going to have to do once tryout starts. For me, that would be very, very impressive. First off, I'm a teacher. I'm a high school teacher. It is very rare that students will ever reach out to me. For some reason, they are scared to death to talk to teachers. Uh, I, I guess I get it. Maybe I was like that when I was that age. So if a child does reach out to a coach in that matter, uh, teachers as well as coaches and so forth who are handling tryouts are going to be very impressed with that. So that can only help you. And, of course, you are gathering information. The coach is going to get back to you and say, hey, we're going to long toss on day one. We're going to run a 60-yard dash. We're going to do this, that, and the other thing. And so then, as a result, you have a chance to prepare. So the first category is come prepared, whether that's physically, your arm strength, knowing what type of drills you might have to do and try to practice them ahead of time. It is only going to help you. 
Now, the second category uh, of tips that I have for players is act like you want to be there. And uh, like I said before, I can't tell you how many times that I've seen players come out and they are attempting to try to make a team and their body language screams like I'd kind of rather be somewhere else. And there is no turn off that is worse than that. Uh, coaches do not like negative body language. So act like you want to be there. Showing enthusiasm can mean a lot. OK, um, now that doesn't mean fake hustle. There is a difference and coaches can tell between a player who is very enthusiastic, who's hustling and someone who is only hustling because it's tryouts. And you may think that you can hide that from a coach, but coaches typically are more experienced enough to know the difference between uh, authentic hustle and fake hustle as well. So in the area of hustle, there's a saying that goes, never let a coach guess about your love for the game. So make it obvious. Um, you should, as I said, act as if there is no place on the planet you would rather be than on that baseball field. As you move older, as you get older, the competitive nature of tryouts is just going to get bigger and bigger. Now, I know as, let's say, an incoming 10th grader, uh, I know that the high school program is going to be a significant increase in their commitment. So if they don't appear to have that energy, that enthusiasm in during tryouts, then I'm going to have to guess they're probably not going to have that enthusiasm or, or energy uh, two months down the road when we need it the most come, say, playoff time and so forth. So um, Make sure you are putting in that enthusiasm and showing the coach clearly that you want to be there and you are interested uh, in playing. Otherwise, they're going to assume that you just don't have what it takes to play at that level. All right, so the first category was come physically prepared. The second one was act like you want to be there. Now, let me just throw in a couple other things to keep in mind if you are a player. You have to understand that what coaches are looking at and how they are judging you is often different than how you are judging yourself. So let me give an example. Let's say you have two players, and we do some scrimmages during tryouts and so forth. And one player finishes a day in that scrimmage and gets two hits. Well, of course, he's probably on top of the world because he goes home. He gets to tell his parents, hey, I had two hits today in the scrimmage. I really look good. But as a coach, I may look at those hits and say, well, those were both weak ground balls. And they were hit to a player who is probably not going to make the team. If there was a high school player playing there, that kid would have been out by 10 feet at first base. So you want to be careful what it is that you're looking at because as a coach, I'm looking for skills. All right. If you have another player in that game who popped up twice but squared that ball up and hit a mile-high pop-up to the shortstop, and then the next time up hits a mile-high pop-up to center field, that kid is going to be impressive to me because they had the ability to take a very aggressive swing, and they squared up both of their balls and smoked them. They just got under it. So I can work with that kid and get him to hit more line drives and so forth, but it's very difficult to teach a kid to square a ball up like that. So that kid may be going home saying, well, I didn't have a good scrimmage. I went 0 for 2. I don't know if I'm going to make the team. But in my mind, I don't care whether they got hits or not. I'm looking for skills. So you have to make sure uh, that you um, are careful how you are judging yourself because coaches may not be looking at uh, the same thing. Now, also keep in mind that coaches, particularly at the high school level, um, are going to be weighing or balancing two different things. They're going to want to see what your current skill level is, but they also have to make a prediction as to what your potential skill level is going to be in the future. So let me give an example. So let's say I have a 10th grader and an 11th grader that are trying out. And let's say the 11th grader has a little bit more ability than the 10th grader. Okay, well, if I stop right there, then the 11th grader should make the team. They're a better baseball player. But I not only have to look at what their current skills are, I have to look at what their potential talent's going to be in the future. So I have to make a prediction. If I kept the 10th grader next year this time, when that 10th grader is now at 11th grader, will he be better next year than the current 11th grader is now? So there are some situations where I have some tough decisions. There may be a case where I do not keep a more talented 11th grader because I'm predicting that the 10th grader is going to develop better in the future. 
that's a tough decision because um, the player certainly is going to be focusing on his current abilities, but the coach may be looking at a future potential a little bit more than you are. Now, the last thing I want want players to keep in mind, especially if we're talking about school baseball here, are things like grades and behavior. Now, I mentioned before about the concept of makeup. And I had a conversation um, with a player one time about this because the player wasn't sure whether they were going to try out for their school team. And I said, well, why wouldn't you try out? And he said, well, I know there's a lot of good players, and I'm not sure if I can, I can play at that level. And I said, well, you can decide. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. But just hear me out on this one here. I, this player had never played school baseball before. They had only played summer ball and travel and so forth. And I said, you have to understand, school baseball is very different than travel ball. Okay, During travel ball during the summer, a coach is not going to care what your grades are. They're not going to care how you behaved in the classroom. Okay, It's the summer. There is no school. So that does not factor at all in most coaches' minds during the summer. But in school baseball, a coach has to care about those things. A, co- a school coach does not want to keep a player and then have that player have to leave because they got suspended or they have detentions and now they got to miss practice. They do not want problems. So I know for a fact there are a lot of coaches out there who are doing school teams and running tryouts who do care about grades and your behavior, and they will very much uh, more likely to keep a player who may be less talented but they know is not going to be a problem because their grades are good, they don't get in trouble in school, they're very respectful, uh, and they're just not going to be a problem. And that matters a lot more for school tryouts than it would for just an average summer team. So if you may, might be a less talented player, don't think that that is going to be a death sentence for you because coaches do consider other things, especially for a school ball. Now, the last tip here for players is basically if you do not make that team, it is not the end of the world. There has never been a time in baseball history where there are more opportunities to play baseball. There are so many different teams out there. Uh, back when I was younger, really, if you didn't play school baseball, that was pretty much it. You you were pretty done, pretty much done. That is not the case today. So if you enjoy baseball, please do not let a negative tryout experience uh, cut your career. If you like playing the game, understand kids are going to develop at different times and paces. So keep at it, keep working hard, and there's always opportunities to play the game. All right, folks. Well, that is going to wrap things up for today. So hopefully if you're a coach, you learned a couple things. And of course, I could go on and on and talk for hours about a lot of different things about trials. But I tried to come up with some categories and some little things that uh, just to make you aware of some things that helped me and hopefully they can help you as well. Okay. So until next time, thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate your time and uh, have a great day. And until we, uh, until we meet again, just go back to uh, baseballbytheyard.com. Check out some of those written posts that I've done. I'm going to be doing some more videos shortly when the weather kind of gets a little bit better. All right, folks. So thank you very much and have a good night. Take care. Hey everybody, before you leave, if you like the show, you can be a big help when it comes to spreading the word. First, check out BaseballByTheYard.com. Be sure to subscribe and take what I call the five post challenge. Read any five of my blog posts, and I think you'll find that there's no baseball instructional website like it online. Second, check out the over 200 videos I've posted on YouTube for players and coaches. While you're there, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so that you're notified every time I post a new video. And lastly, like, comment, and leave a review on all these platforms to help other people get this information too. I'm Coach Bob McCreary. Thank you so much for your time, and best of luck on your baseball journey.